Here's an astronaut barf bag right here. So let's say you're about to throw up in space. Quick, you get your barf bag open. And now think about what happens on Earth. You throw up and you have a bag of something horrible and then you throw it away. But in space, if I throw up in this bag, what am I going to do with it? This bag has to stay with me in space for months. So we want a really good barf bag. So we have one that, uh, that will really protect us. And this one has a... Uh, has a liner in it so that when you throw up into it you can clean your face off and then you can push everything inside and then it comes with its own Ziploc to clean put inside the Ziploc and then you can throw it down into the wet trap. All right you guys wanted to hear it in sulfur hexafluoride here it is. <laughs> EA Sports it's in the game. Hey everybody, so a lot of you wanted to see how much bacteria grows on a face mask, so I'm going to be testing that and bringing you guys with me to see how I do it. I start by disinfecting my area and washing my hands, I then take these fresh agar plates that I bought off of Amazon, and they come with little sterile q-tips. I labeled it inside the mask, outside the mask, and then I swabbed a sterile one before I wore it to work that day. I wet the q-tip with bottled water, and then I swabbed the mask surface, and then I put it into the center of the plate and spread it out using a star-like motion. I then take a clean Q-tip and repeat that on the inside of the mask, swabbing it onto the next agar plate. Once that's done, I tape them shut, and then you can either leave them at room temperature for a couple days or make an incubator out of a styrofoam box and a light bulb. Then we wait. Um, in this case, I waited six days, so here's the bacteria on the inside of the mask, pretty gross. Here's the outside, not as much. And then here's a sterile one, clean of course. I'm going to be making another video of what it looks like under the microscope. STEM majors, let's go around the room and tell everybody something we understand but absolutely refuse. I'm about to blow your mind. The outer core, inner core, and mantle of the Earth is a hypothesis. I've spoken to my geology professor about this. It, the entire concept is a hypothesis. We don't actually know. We assume that the mantle is 80% magnesium because we take samples from volcanoes and things like that. We assume that there's a liquid outer core because... S waves, which can't pass through a liquid, are bouncing off somewhere random within the middle of the earth instead of passing right through. And we assume that the outer core and the inner core is mostly iron because of the magnetic polarity of the earth. But did you know that scientists have actually tried numerous times to dig through the crust into the mantle to find actual evidence that it exists, but we can't get there because the pressure is too much? So scientists just take these little bits and pieces of fact, put it together to form a hypothesis that we teach us fact. There would be quite a few more clacks, all happening very rapidly at one point. Adding up in all to 313 total collisions. Well, actually, hang on. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay, 314 clacks. If the first block was 1 million times the mass of the other, then again, with all of our crazy idealistic conditions, almost all of the clacks happen in one big burst, this time resulting in a total of 3,141 collisions. Perhaps you see the pattern here, though it's forgivable if you don't, since it defies all expectation. When the mass of that first block is some power of 100 times the mass of the second, the total number of collisions have the same digits as pi. This absolutely blew my mind when it was first shared with me. Credit to the viewer Henry Cavill for introducing me to this fact, which was- Actually, science now shows that you should not use ice on an injury. Well, but me doctor and our healthcare professional 
told me I should use ice, isn't it? Well, that may be the case. Old habits die hard. But you see, the old theory of rest, ice, compression, elevation, which was developed in the 1970s, was refuted by the same people, the same doctors that developed that, was refuted in 2014. You see, what happens when you injure yourself is all these inflammatory cells rush to the site of injury, and they sort of protect the area so that other cells can come in and clean up and uh, and repair the injury. So if you prevent those cells from getting there with ice, you're slowing everything down. What then? So only compress and elevate. Well, now what we're using is the METH acronym, which stands for Movement, Elevation, Traction, Today I'm going to anodize something small, just a single welded ring. It has very little surface area, so the reaction is going to happen quite fast. Let's do it in real time and go. Oh, I probably should have done it a bit faster to stretch out the rainbow a bit, but that does look quite nice. Now we have to flip it over because there's a part where the little gator clip bites down on it, and we need to get that part under the water next. So I'm going to crank my machine down to the low setting because the low voltage colors don't interfere with the high voltage colors. So just like the niobium, we're going to add a little indigo on the end. And perfect.